And we are live. Welcome to Olivia's Stories, ladies and gentlemen. Story number one. The sun was already starting to set as I stood by the huge window of my office, overlooking the bustling city below. Today had been a whirlwind. 25 years I'd been with this company, pouring every ounce of my dedication and sweat into my work. And today, today, it was going to pay off. I glanced down at the invitation lying on my desk. It was a sleek card embossed with golden letters. John Miller, in recognition of 25 years of exemplary service, we are honored to present you with the Employee of the Quarter Century Award. Quarter Century. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? A chuckle escaped my lips. I never thought I'd be at a job long enough to get such an award. My fingers lightly traced the edge of the card. I hadn't told Lisa yet. I wanted to surprise her. I imagined the proud look in her eyes, the way she'd hug me tight, whispering in my ear. I always knew you were the best. We'd been through thick and thin, from the time when we could barely afford rent, to now, living comfortably in our dream home. This award was as much hers as it was mine. A buzz from my phone pulled me out of my daydream. It was a reminder for the rehearsal for tomorrow's ceremony. Can't be late for that, I murmured to myself, quickly gathering my things. The office was mostly empty by now. A few colleagues waved at me as I made my way out, congratulating me for my big day tomorrow. I smiled, nodding in appreciation. It felt good, this recognition. It felt earned. The drive home was smooth. Traffic was lighter than usual, and I found myself humming along to the radio. My plan was simple. Get home, tell Lisa about the award, maybe even go out for a celebratory dinner. I'd been so wrapped up in work lately that we hadn't had much time together, just the two of us. As I turned into our street, something odd caught my attention. A car. Not just any car, but one that I recognized. Sleek, silver, with tinted windows. Mr. Gray's car. My boss's car. Why would he be here? I pondered aloud. It wasn't like him to make house calls, and I definitely hadn't invited him over. Parking my car, I decided to check our home security system via my phone. An uneasy feeling settled in my stomach when I saw that the cameras were off. Odd, I thought. Lisa never turns them off. Before entering the house, a memory flashed. I recalled an old video system I'd set up when we first moved in. It was more for fun than anything else, a hobby I picked up during one of my business trips. I decided to check it before going in. With every second, my heart pounded louder in my chest. Why was I so nervous? What was I expecting to find? I sat in my car, nervously fidgeting with the old laptop I'd kept in the trunk. Booting it up, I opened the video files from the old security system. My hands were clammy, my mind raced with a thousand thoughts. The first few clips seemed normal. Lisa was in the garden, tending to her roses, her favorite pastime. It was calming to see her so engrossed in her world. But then the timestamp showed the hour when I was deep in a meeting. Mr. Gray's car pulled into our driveway. He stepped out, looking around before heading to the front door. Lisa greeted him, not with the cordial nod you'd give a colleague of your husband, but with a warm embrace. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. They moved into the living room. Their conversation was muted, but their body language spoke volumes. They laughed. They shared a bottle of wine. The same wine Lisa and I had been saving for a special occasion. At one point, they danced, her head resting on his shoulder, both lost in the music and in each other. It felt as though someone had punched me in the gut. This wasn't just a casual visit. This was intimate, personal. I closed the laptop abruptly, gasping for air. My mind refused to accept what my eyes had just seen. I drove aimlessly for what felt like hours, trying to process everything. Every memory, every sweet moment shared with Lisa was now tainted with doubt. Was our entire marriage a lie, or had something changed along the way? Seeking some solitude, I ended up at a small park we used to visit when we were younger. It was our spot, a place where we shared dreams, made plans, and promised to be each other's forever. The irony wasn't lost on me. Sitting on a bench, I tried to recall any signs, any hints that might have indicated Lisa's change of heart. But all I remembered were the good times. Sure, we had our disagreements, but what couple didn't? Nothing that would warrant this kind of betrayal. My phone buzzed with a message from Lisa. Hey love, where are you? 
I made your favorite for dinner. Hope you'll be home soon. I stared at the message, feeling a strange mix of anger, sadness, and disbelief. How could she act so normal? Did she think I wouldn't find out? Or did she not care? Tears threatened to spill, but I held them back. I needed to think, to plan my next move. I couldn't confront her without evidence, and I certainly didn't want to make a scene. I needed answers, but first, I needed to gather my thoughts. The sun was barely out, casting a dim golden hue over the city as I started my day. I hadn't slept much. Every time I closed my eyes, the images of Lisa and Mr. Gray replayed in my mind. It was torture. As I got into my car and drove to the office, I could feel a deep sense of unease. Every red light, every pedestrian seemed like an obstacle, delaying me from finding some answers to the chaos that had become my life. I had always taken pride in my office, a corner spot with a panoramic view of the city. But today, the skyline, usually a source of inspiration, felt mocking. Instead of focusing on work, I found myself watching the people down below, wondering how many of them carried secrets of their own. When lunchtime rolled around, I knew I couldn't face the office canteen. I texted Roger, need to talk, usual spot in 20? His reply was instant, be there. Our usual spot was a small, out of the way cafe where we'd shared countless conversations over the years. It was private, away from prying eyes and eavesdropping ears. As I sat waiting for Roger, the aroma of fresh coffee beans being ground felt oddly comforting. When Roger arrived, his face was lined with concern. You look like hell, he said, ordering us both a coffee. Taking a deep breath, I relayed the events of the previous evening. He listened intently, only interrupting to ask clarifying questions. Once I finished, he took a long sip of his coffee, seemingly collecting his thoughts. Before you confront Lisa, he finally said, you need undeniable evidence, something she can't refute. I nodded, recalling the grainy security footage. But how? He hesitated for a moment. A private investigator. It's the best shot we've got. The idea seemed drastic, straight out of a detective novel. But I was desperate. Roger quickly jotted down a number. Her name's Clara. She's discreet and the best in the business. Call her. With Roger's encouragement, I dialed Clara that evening. She had a calm, collected voice that instantly put me at ease. After explaining my situation, she agreed to take on the case. The next few days were a whirlwind of emotions. Clara was in constant touch, updating me on her findings. She tracked Lisa's movements, her meetings with Mr. Gray, and even their conversations. Each revelation was like a dagger to my heart. However, one evening, as I was poring over some reports, my phone buzzed with a message from Clara. Urgent meeting needed. Tomorrow, 9 a.m., my office. The weight in my chest grew heavier. What had she found? I arrived at Clara's office promptly at 9 a.m. The air was thick with anticipation. Her office was located in a nondescript building, ensuring her client's utmost privacy. The room itself was dimly lit, with walls adorned with various awards and certifications. However, one particular wall caught my attention. It was covered in photos and strings connecting various clues, like a scene from a detective film. Clara, a tall woman with sharp features and an even sharper mind, gestured for me to sit. Without wasting any time, she turned on a projector. The screen lit up with images of Lisa and Mr. Gray, some of them in places I recognized, like our favorite restaurant and the park where we had our first date. She began narrating her findings. Over the past few days, I've observed a pattern they meet up at least three times a week. It's not just casual encounters, John. I've recorded some of their conversations. She played an audio clip. Hearing Lisa's voice was painful, but what was more painful were the words she spoke, her intimate tone with Mr. Gray, and the laughter they shared. They discussed future plans, vacations, and even mused about a world where they didn't have to hide. I felt a rush of emotions, anger, sadness, disbelief. How long has this been going on? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. From what I've gathered, it's been at least a year, Clara responded. A year. A whole year of deception. I struggled to process it all. Did you find anything on what they're planning next? 
Clara hesitated for a moment before continuing. There's an upcoming business trip. Both Lisa and Mr. Gray are booked for it, but the peculiar thing is, they've booked a single room. It felt like the room was closing in on me. Clara handed me a folder containing all the evidence, photos, recordings, and even some of their message exchanges. You deserve to know the truth, John. I'm sorry it had to be this way. I nodded, barely holding back tears. Thank you, Clara. As I left her office, the reality of it all sank in. I had to confront Lisa, but the thought of facing her was daunting. How do you confront someone you've loved and trusted for over two decades? I drove around the city, lost in thought. Nightfall approached, and the city lights seemed to blur together. I pulled over, gazing at the river. The shimmering water reflected my own tumultuous emotions. Taking a deep breath, I picked up my phone and dialed Lisa's number. It was time for answers. The ringing of the phone seemed to last an eternity. When Lisa finally picked up, her voice was light, unsuspecting. Hey John, how was your day? Hearing her voice brought a flood of memories, our wedding, vacations, shared laughter, and dreams for the future. But now, it all seemed tainted. I took a deep breath to steady myself. Lisa, we need to talk. Can you come home now? There was a pause. She must have sensed the urgency in my voice. All right, I'm on my way. The waiting was torturous. Every tick of the clock felt like an echo in the vast emptiness of our home. The door creaked open and Lisa walked in, concern evident on her face. John, what's going on? I spread out the evidence Clara had given me on the table. The photos, the audio recordings, the messages. Lisa's face turned pale as she took in the undeniable truth before her. Tears welled up in her eyes as she began. John, I... But I raised my hand to stop her. Just tell me why, Lisa. After all these years, why? She looked down, struggling to find her words. It started innocently. Business meetings turned into lunches and then dinners. We found comfort in each other's company. I never meant for it to go this far, John. But over time, the line between friendship and something more blurred. I am so, so sorry. I could feel my heart shattering, but a strange calmness settled over me. We built a life together, Lisa. Shared dreams, made promises, and you threw it all away for a fleeting moment of happiness. She sobbed. I know I messed up. I know there's no excuse for what I did. I just, I wish I could turn back time. But some things, once broken, can't be fixed. The trust that was the foundation of our relationship had crumbled. Lisa, I think we need to take some time apart. I need to process this, heal, and decide what's next. She nodded, tears streaming down her face. I understand, John. I'll move out for a while. The following days were a blur. Lisa moved in with her sister, and I was left in our home, surrounded by memories of better times. Friends and family reached out, offering their support, but the loneliness was overwhelming. I decided to sell our home and start afresh. With every item I packed, I let go of a piece of the past. It was painful but necessary. I realized that sometimes, the hardest part of moving on is accepting that the other person already did. The finality of signing the divorce papers was heart-wrenching, but it also marked a new beginning. I embarked on a journey of self-discovery, traveling and meeting new people. And though the pain of betrayal never truly goes away, in time, it becomes a scar. A reminder of battles fought and lessons learned. After everything that's unfolded, I find myself standing at a fork in the road. The weight of the decision I need to make feels like a stone in my chest. You see, some say love is forgiving and that time can mend the deepest of wounds. Others argue that certain betrayals are unforgivable, leaving scars that never truly heal. My heart still aches when I think of Jane. The love, memories, and years we shared can't simply be erased. I sometimes wonder if we can rebuild, start anew, and perhaps find a way back to each other. But then, the pain of her betrayal, the hurt I felt that day when I watched that footage, hits me like a tidal wave. You, dear viewer, have been with me through this tumultuous journey, witnessing every raw emotion and every twist and turn. And so, I ask you, what do you think? Should I consider giving Jane a second chance, believing in the power of love and forgiveness? 
or do you think what she did was utterly unacceptable, a violation that no amount of time or remorse can mend? I eagerly await your thoughts. Your insight might just be the beacon of light I need in this storm. Story number two. From the moment the sun peeped through the curtains, John always had one thought in mind, his love for Mary. 20 years of togetherness had flown by, seemingly in the blink of an eye. They had crafted a life together that, to the outside world, appeared as close to perfection as one could get. John often heard his friends say, you and Mary are relationship goals. Their mornings were filled with playful banters over breakfast, while evenings usually saw them cuddled up on the couch, watching their favorite shows or discussing the kids' day. Their two children, Lily and Max, were the apples of their eyes. The dog, Bella, was the lively cherry on top of their family Sunday. The white picket fence around their house wasn't just for show, it genuinely felt like they were living a dream. John often found himself reminiscing about the early days when they were young, wild, and deeply in love. The way Mary's eyes would light up when he surprised her with a bouquet of roses, or how they'd dance in the rain, not a care in the world. Those moments in John's mind were pure magic. However, of late, there had been subtle changes. Nothing dramatic or alarming, just little things that felt off. Mary seemed a touch more distant. She laughed a little less, and her gaze often wandered away, lost in thought. There were times when she'd come home late from work, her reason being an unexpected meeting or an office event. John tried not to think much of it. After all, they had built a foundation of trust over two decades. Doubting her over trivial matters felt wrong. Still, at night, as John lay in bed with Mary's back turned to him, a tiny, nagging voice at the back of his head whispered, What if there's more to this story? He would quickly shoosh it away, pulling Mary close and reminding himself of all the love-filled years they had shared. Surely, they were strong enough to weather any storm. But as days turned into weeks, the feeling of unease grew stronger. John couldn't shake off the idea that maybe, just maybe, his perfect life wasn't so perfect after all. The days took on a new hue for John, a shade darker than what he was used to. Each moment felt stretched, and every second was a question mark. The trust that had been their anchor for two decades now wavered, and John found himself caught in a web of doubt and un essay. It all began on a quiet Saturday afternoon. Mary had gone out for one of her frequent work meetings. John was sorting through their bedroom closet, trying to find an old photo album to take a trip down memory lane and maybe remind himself of better times. As he delved deeper into the closet, a small glint caught his eye. Pushing aside old scarves and winter hats, he found a phone he didn't recognize. It wasn't Mary's usual phone, that much was sure. Curiosity peaked, he turned it on. The screen came alive, showing numerous notifications from someone named Alex. The messages seemed intimate, with words like miss you and can't wait to see you again. A cold wave of realization washed over John and his heart raced. Could it be? Could Mary really be seeing someone else? He didn't want to jump to conclusions. Perhaps there was an innocent explanation. Maybe Alex was just a close friend or a relative Mary had reconnected with. Trying to calm his racing heart, he decided to play detective. For the next few days, he paid closer attention to Mary's habits. The late night phone calls, the giggles, the secret smiles to herself, it all started making a grim kind of sense. One evening, he took a bold step. John decided to follow Mary discreetly. He watched as she entered a quaint little cafe and settled into a corner booth. Soon after, a man walked in. Alex. They embraced warmly, a little too warmly for just friends. John felt like a voyeur, peering into a world he wasn't meant to see. The sight of Mary laughing, her hand lingering on Alex's, shattered him. He wanted to confront them right there, ask them how they could betray his trust but something held him back. The pain was intense, but John wasn't one to make impulsive decisions. He needed to be sure. He needed a plan. Driving home that night, the weight of the world pressed down on him. The woman he had loved and trusted for 20 years was living a double life. The pain of betrayal was sharp and raw. But John wasn't going to let this slide. He was going to uncover the truth, no matter the cost. 
As the days passed, John's initial shock morphed into a steely determination. He felt like a man reborn, with a newfound clarity of purpose. Every fiber of his being screamed for justice, but he was determined to act wisely, not impulsively. He realized that for maximum impact and to ensure Mary truly understood the depth of her betrayal, he needed to confront her in a way she would never forget. The idea struck him one quiet evening as he was thumbing through old family photos, a dinner party with all of Mary's family. The very people she had grown up with, the ones who had celebrated their union and had been part of every significant chapter of their lives, they all loved and respected John. Revealing the truth in front of them would hit Mary the hardest, making her realize the gravity of her actions. He began his preparations. Invitations were sent out under the guise of a surprise anniversary party that John was secretly planning for Mary. Her family, completely unaware of the storm brewing, responded with enthusiasm, touched by John's romantic gesture. Meanwhile, John started gathering evidence. He discreetly documented Mary's secret rendezvous with Alex, making sure he had video proof of their intimate moments. It was a difficult task, for each captured moment felt like a dagger through his heart. But he pressed it on, fueled by a burning desire for justice. As the date of the dinner neared, John felt a mixture of dread and anticipation. He arranged for the children to spend the weekend at a friend's house, wanting to shield them from the impending fallout. The dining table was set to perfection, complete with Mary's favorite flowers and dishes. The atmosphere was festive, with soft music playing in the background. But beneath the veneer of celebration, a storm was brewing. Guests started arriving, filling the house with laughter and warmth. Mary was touched, her eyes misty with emotion. Little did she know that this would be a night she'd never forget. As the main course was served and the room echoed with happy chatter, John took a deep breath, preparing himself for the most challenging act of his life. His plan was set in motion, and there was no turning back now. The moment of reckoning was here. The atmosphere in the room was thick with celebration. Memories of the past 20 years were shared, glasses clinked, and the air was filled with hearty laughter. Each of these sounds and sights seemed surreal to John, like a distant echo as he waited for the right moment. Mary was radiant, her eyes gleaming with surprise and appreciation for what she believed to be a touching gesture by her husband. She leaned in to whisper, This is the sweetest thing you've ever done for me. John, though tormented inside, just nodded, masking his turmoil with a practiced smile. As dessert was served, John felt it was time. He stood up, tapping his glass gently, the universal signal for attention. The room fell silent, all eyes on him, expectantly awaiting a loving speech. John took a deep breath, trying to calm his racing heart. Thank you all for being here tonight, he began, voice steady. Today, I wanted to talk about trust, about love, and about truth. The guests exchanged glances, sensing a shift in the atmosphere. Mary looked up, her face a mask of confusion. John continued, Over the years, we've all shared numerous happy moments, haven't we? But today, I want to share something else, something I recently discovered. He paused, taking out a small remote from his pocket. The lights dimmed and the large TV screen in the living room flickered to life. Displayed on it were clips of Mary and Alex, their secret meetings, and intimate conversations. The room was engulfed in a stunned silence, each scene more incriminating than the last. As the video ended, the weight of the room's shock was palpable. Mary's face had drained of all color, her eyes wide with disbelief and horror. Her family members stared at the screen, then at her, seeking some kind of explanation. How could you? John's voice trembled, no longer able to contain the hurt. Twenty years, Mary. Was it all a lie? Mary's voice broke as she tried to respond. John, I... I never meant for any of this to happen. It was a mistake. But John cut her off. A mistake? For how long? How many days, weeks, and months was this mistake continuing? The room echoed with murmured whispers and gasps. Mary's siblings tried to intervene, asking John to perhaps discuss this privately, but he stood firm. In front of the very family that celebrated our union, I want you to know the depth of your betrayal, he declared, eyes filled with tears. I gave you everything, and this is what I get in return. Mary was sobbing now, her voice a mix of regret and desperation. I'm so sorry, John. Please let's talk away from all this. But John had said all he wanted to. 
You need to leave Mary, leave our home, and let me find a way to heal. The party, which had started in joy and reminiscence, ended in heartbreak and disbelief. The confrontation was more painful than John had anticipated, but he felt a grim sense of closure. The truth was out, and the next chapter of his life awaited. In the days following the confrontation, John's home, which once buzzed with life and laughter, transformed into a silent monument to the love that once was. The deafening silence was often interrupted by the constant ringing of the telephone and knocks on the door, but John couldn't bear to face the world or its barrage of questions and sympathies. Every corner of the house held a memory, the couch where they'd cuddled and watched countless movies, the kitchen where they'd cooked meals together, even the small dent in the wall from when they'd tried, laughingly and unsuccessfully, to move in a too large bookshelf. Everything echoed Mary's absence. One evening, as John was aimlessly wandering from room to room, he stumbled upon the old photo album he had been searching for weeks earlier. Opening it, he was flooded with a tidal wave of memories, their wedding day, the birth of their kids, holidays, and birthdays. He realized that while the pain of betrayal was sharp, the pain of loss was even deeper. Their children, Lily and Max, were equally heartbroken. They had known their family as a pillar of love and trust, and seeing it crumble was beyond comprehension. They missed their mother but also grappled with feelings of anger and disappointment. John did his best to shield them, ensuring they knew they were loved and that their parents' issues weren't their fault. One day, a letter arrived, Mary's handwriting. She wrote of her guilt, her regrets, and her undying love for John. She spoke of the loneliness she had felt, leading her down a path she regretted with every fiber of her being. She begged for a chance to explain, not to mend their relationship, but to provide closure. Against his better judgment, John agreed to meet. Seeing Mary again was like reopening a wound. She looked haggard, a shadow of her former self. Their conversation was filled with tears, regrets, and some semblance of understanding. Mary explained how her relationship with Alex had begun innocently, but how she'd lost her way amidst feelings of neglect and the need for attention. While John could understand, he couldn't forget or forgive. The trust that was the bedrock of their relationship had crumbled and there was no going back. They parted ways with a promise to co-parent their children and keep their well-being at the forefront. As the weeks turned into months, John slowly began to rebuild his life. He dove into his work, spent quality time with Lily and Max, and sought therapy to process his pain. Friends and family rallied around him, their support acting as a balm for his wounded soul. Despite the hurt and the betrayal, John realized he needed to let go of the past to embrace the future. While he might never fully heal, he was determined to find happiness again, not just for himself, but for his children. The aftermath of the storm was painful, but as with all storms, it also brought clarity and, in time, a new beginning.